didn't get a chance to say too much about it, but then I really want to spend the balance of time uh, doing examples. And I guess Don did a bunch of examples for you in the review on, on, on Sunday, and we've got a bunch more to do. And it, along them we will do uh, uh, some entropy calculations. And so we touched on the second law of thermodynamics. We called the word entropy, but we really didn't dive too deeply into it, although we kind of did. There's really not too much more we, we, we have to do. But here's what I want to review. Here's what we did last time. Uh, last time, oh, Oh, and I looked up all that turbo stuff you guys were asking, but I better not take time there. That was interesting. Uh, old school turbos, what I was thinking, and now I understand your guys' questions better because you were thinking new school turbos. Uh, anyways, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stay away from that uh, for, for just a second in the interest of time. But here's where we were left off, or here's what we were doing. Uh, we were building engines, and of course we had a bunch of uh, Stirling engines out here, uh, and we had some animation showing a four-stroke and a two-stroke in the Stirling engine, and uh, well, the whole idea from a thermodynamics point of view was this, that you would take something that was hot and so you would add energy into your engine. This is what we call Q sub H, the heat of the engine. And as we added it to it, the engine would convert through some kind of mechanism because heat has to do with these moving molecules. And so in our case, we were often pushing a piston and then that pushing of the piston did work. And so my question last time, and I'll repeat it here, was this. Could you get more work out from your engine than heat energy you put in? You're right. And the answer is no. No way. Uh, and why not? <laughs> it's conservation of energy. We would say this, is, this would be in violation of the first law of the thermodynamics. And we had this discussion at the start of Thursday. We said, look, the laws of physics, whether they be conservation of angular momentum, momentum, or energy, the first law of thermodynamics, they tell us what can and cannot happen, right? And so what cannot happen is this. You cannot get more energy out than you put in. It's too bad because the world would be a very different place if we could always just create energy along the way. Maybe we could start with a little battery here and before the day's over have enough energy to run the whole city. That would be kind of nice. But it doesn't work that way. And so we move on to ask, what, well, what can we do? And we ask then this next one. Could you get out as much work as heat energy you put in? <laughs> And this brought up a whole nother discussion, which leads us really into our second law of thermodynamics. We were thinking about this and said, well, sure, why not? Because certainly from conservation of energy, you would say it might be possible. You'd have to do everything maybe just perfectly. But I went on to say, no, you couldn't do this either. And I really didn't get a chance to talk too much about it, and that's where we need to finish up this chapter and say, well, why not? Why can't this happen? And the answer here is in another principle. The second law of thermodynamics has to do with the entropy. And so, as we had a little discussion here on last time, is what is entropy. And so I'll put this in blue here to say that not only are you adding heat engine or, or heat or energy to your engine, but you're also adding entropy. And entropy is, as we'll kind of see in a second, this mathematical setup. It is how much heat are you adding divided then by what is the temperature. And that is what we're going to call entropy. Uh, as you guys pointed out last time, entropy is kind of a random motion to the molecules. Entropy is a measurement of how much randomness do you have. And I got to admit, this little equation here doesn't really indicate it here, but we'll kind of set that up. And that's unfortunate all the time we will have to do our thermodynamics. And you will pick this up later on in your education when you transfer and do a thermodynamics on, a, on an upper division level here. But here's the issue. The entropy comes in, the entropy is going to have to go out. And the entropy that goes out then, SC, 
must be QC over TC. And again, we'll kind of work towards these equations here, but here's the point. The point is, if you got this, where 100% of the heat going in went into work, then how much heat energy would come out of your engine would have to be zero. Fair enough? But if you had zero heat coming out of your engine, how much entropy do you have coming out? Zero. So you couldn't get the entropy out. And that's the argument here of why this can't happen either. It's a second law of thermodynamics. So, so this would violate the second law of thermodynamics. So this isn't going to happen. The only thing that can happen then is the workout is less than the heat. And fortunately, it doesn't have to be too much less. It could be 99.999% less. But it will depend up on the temperature of your cold environment. And so unfortunately, usually this work that we get out is quite a bit less, like 80% less than the heat we put in. And so the majority of our energy that we put in also has to come out as heat. And we don't often get much work from our heat engines. Uh, we get quite a bit. We can get in our car and we can drive 200 miles and, you know, have a good spring break and hopefully you will. Uh, don't think about it too early. You got a lot coming on. I know you got tests tomorrow in math and tests in this one. And, but other than that, have a good spring break. But don't come back with a sprained wrist or on crutches. That seems to always happen. Of my 150 students, there's always one coming back on a crutch and you know, or with a brace on. Yeah. So you're saying that if there's temperature, if there's no temperature leaving, the entropy is on Well, okay. Now, uh, now you're asking me about the special case. I guess the one special case is if my cold environment was absolute zero, zero Kelvin, right? Then I could have zero over zero and then we can get into some calculus discussions. But zero over zero could be a finite number, right? It doesn't have to be zero. And so I could have zero energy leaving into a world of zero Kelvin, which we don't have, but okay, let's say we did. Then we could get some entropy out, even though the t even though the heat energy is zero, and then we could get as much work out as temperature we put in. So I would say yes, there is a very very special situation where we really could get this and still not violate the the second law of thermodynamics. However, I'm trying to be a little practical here. Usually our cold side here is what wherever we're cooling the engine down to, which might be the uh, you know, the ocean or something. And we'll pump water in from the ocean, like we, down here on the Oxnard Plain, which generates most of our electricity around here. We will burn natural gas and get it really hot. And then we'll let it turn a turbine. And then as the expanding gases are cooling, they're cooled down to the temperature of the ocean. Far, far from zero Kelvin. So we've got to have some heat come out. And so that is our idea of intro entropy. And so our entropy, as I'm trying to say here, is, is really one of these laws that tell us what we can and cannot do. And so I would say I can't do this because of the first law of thermodynamics and I can't do this because of the second law of thermodynamics. And so let's spend a little bit time on that. In fact, you can probably see it a little bit better if I also kind of review. Uh, we did, where did I put it? We did some efficiencies of some engines. We said, all right, let's build some. I think the first one we did was that um, four stroke engine. And we said, all right, let's define E, the efficiency, as the work you get out compared to the heat you put in. And according to the first law of thermodynamics, the amount of work must be the difference between these. This is the energy you put in. The energy you put in must equal the sum of the energies that come out. So this would be the hot energy minus the cold energy. If I divide this by the hot energy, I get 1 minus the energy that comes out on the cold side divided by the energy on the hot side. And maybe I should emphasize that all of this is talking about the magnitudes of the energy, so they're all absolute values. And so we had this general equation that said the efficiency 
of any engine is this. And then we looked at a couple of cycles, and I, so I wrote them down here. Let's see, we first looked at the auto cycle. Then, you know, we didn't actually look at the diesel cycle. I commented about it. Maybe I'll put the results here. But I said, that's a homework problem. And uh, it was, or is, and you're probably working on the efficiency of the diesel cycle. But the one we got just to at the very end of class was the Carnot cycle. That was the one that I said would be the most efficient, as you will hopefully soon see. The Carnot cycle is the one where the, as we'll see here, the change in entropy is the least, and so it is the most efficient cycle we could ever have. There are other cycles that are just as efficient as the Carnot cycle, but it was the Carnot cycle that is the most efficient. So we gave it a little sub C here with the idea that the efficiency of all other engines will always be less than or at best equal to the efficiency of the, of the Carnot cycle. And again, didn't really prove that the Carnot cycle is the most efficient, but you will see that, and I don't know if I'd call it a proof today, but you will see it in terms of entropy here in, in just a second here. And so we had some numbers here. Let's see, for the Carnot cycle, if you recall, this came out to be 1 minus, and the small volume over the big volume raised to a gamma minus 1. The diesel cycle, like I said, we didn't work out, but you are asked to, in your homework, you come up with temperature differences um, on that diesel cycle that's in your homework. And again, let me not take the time to define temperature at D and A and C and B. But when you do the homework, or if you've done the homework, they, they have those in there. Uh, the Carnot cycle came out to be 1 over TC over TH. And so these were our different efficiencies. And as I said, this one here is the most efficiency. And in fact, it is this one here that led the earlier scientists to think more about this whole quantity, Q over T, that there was something special about it. Just like the quantity 1 half mv squared. There's something special about it. <coughs> and so they called it energy and it obeyed the conservation of energy. MV. Just shows up. There's something about it, something that's special, and it led scientists to think about momentum and conservation of momentum. And you'll see it here if you do a couple of steps here. Watch. Let's put this in here for the Carnot cycle. And then let's just put the general equation for the efficiency of a heat engine. If you look closely at this, you can then get rid of the one, get rid of the negative. Huh? Oh. Oh, fair enough. Maybe I should Maybe I should be a little more careful here. All right. Uh, I'll subtract one. How's that? And then that will give me a negative TC over TH less than negative T, no, uh, yeah, TC over TH. Um, then I'll multiply by negative one. I think that's what you're saying. So I gotta watch my inequality here. Um, so this is TC over TH greater than or equal to. Uh, I hope this comes out right. And if I write this, no, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, because you're basically divided by negative one. Yeah, but when I divide by negative one, I need to switch the inequality, right? Oh, um, 
Ah, okay. Let me try it again. This is absolute value. Absolute value. Absolute value. Absolute value. All right. Um, so let me try it here. All right, so I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, and if I look closely at this, let me... Uh, let me get rid of the absolute value sign. That, that, that's what I guess I really wanted to say. So, so there's my equation with the absolute value. If I get rid of the absolute value sign, um, let's look closely. QH is already a positive number, right? It's going into the system. But actually, QC is a negative number here. So this is probably better written as, first of all, I'll just put a QH. That really doesn't change anything because that's already a positive number. But when I get rid of the absolute value sign for the QC, then I also have to get rid of the negative number, right? Because I want the, the negative of this, okay? And that's, I guess, really what I wanted to, to see. So I've got a negative, or I, I, well, I guess I got a... Um, a negative here and a positive over there because then if I rearrange this um, T let me put the Q over to here and so I won't mess with the negative sign yet but I'll have a QH over a TH when I bring this over to here, and I will then have a QC over a TC. And now you're beginning to get to the point that I was trying to say, that there's something interesting about this inequality, and there's something interesting about the ratio of Q over T that the early scientists, uh, like I said, begin to notice. If I brought this over to here, then I get QH um, over TH plus QC over TC. Um, oh, did I mess up my inequality again? Well, no, I, I want that. <laughs> I want to show that it's greater than or equal to zero. Where did I foul up again here? Uh, Q, C. So wait, these are positive and these are positive, right? And I don't change the inequality here. <coughs> Did I mess it up here? Why does the negative start on the right side? Yeah, I think I did mess this up because I want I want oh, I want minus of the Is the car not more efficient than just the regular? Yeah, I did mess this up somewhere. Because the way this stands right now, that's a negative number. Ah. Oh, 
Yeah. Okay. Wow. Mm. All right, I'm going to cheat here. There's, some, there's something in the sign there. but <laughs> And I, I guess I should have thought about this more before I... Uh, 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 worked it out here, but there, there's a, other than there's a little sign error here for a moment, here's what I wanted you to see, and here is really the second law of thermodynamics. This is the change in entropy for the hot side. This is the change in entropy of the cold side. And what I guess I'm really trying to say here is if you add up your changes in entropy, you should get a number not equal to zero and that's where I wanted to spend some moments here and that's why I didn't want to hunt down that negative sign error and say look this is the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is a little different than any of the other conservational principles we have dealt with. Okay first of all I think it's more abstract to see yeah Oh, okay, first of all, I think it's more abstract to see what entropy is, but I also think that the fact that it is not an equality, it is a inequality that makes it difficult to do and to understand. So I want to spend the balance of the time doing a bunch of calculations with the inequality here and letting you see some of the calculations but here's what the second law of thermodynamics is saying and hopefully it makes sense to you that there will be a change and another change. The two changes together will result in a net positive increase of entropy. The second law of thermodynamics simply says this, the sum of the change of all the entropies will always come out to be greater than or equal to zero. And here's what I mean by that. If I watch carefully, other than I got that little sign error here, when I look at this, here's what happens. This heat, oh, There's my sign error. Crap. Uh, okay, but, all right. So, uh, this is coming out of the hot. And that's really what I wanted to focus on is what coming out of the hot. So, this is my, this is my negative number. What comes out of this goes into, into this. But this is constantly warming up. This then is really the entropy coming out. So that Q here that is the is the negative one when it comes out of the out of the engine. Uh, which I think, yeah. Um, on the book, it says Q over T C plus minus Q over T H is greater than zero. So I did get this sign right. Is greater than zero. Yeah, and that's what I have after I. Fixed it. Minus. It's plus a negative Q over T H. So I think the first part is minus. Huh? Still lost me. <coughs> oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, that, okay. Uh, fair enough. That's a special case here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, that's exactly, that's the best special case I can show you. That's what I want to show you, show you next here before I get past the, the general principle. Yeah. Should we try to understand the, the Carnot cycle in the mechanical process or is it mostly like an abstract ideal? Well, you, I guess both. Uh, it, it is, it's, in one sense, it's an abstract idea that it's, it's, it's a slow process that we're probably not going to build anything exactly like it in terms of a real image. Perry itself, well, I was trying to, to visualize it versus the other cycles and the other cycles perpetuate. I mean you're adding fuel but it's, it felt like you're adding motion and you're to the Carnot cycle. No, the Carnot cycle is still a uh, uh, I guess it it looks like this. If this is point A, this is point B, this is point C, this is point D, point A, something like this. 
So, I mean, so, uh, it's not like you can't actually build it. Because I really could start with a gas right here that is at a small volume, so it's compressed, and it's at a lot of pressure. So it's also probably very warm, right? And then what I can do is let it get bigger, okay, while the gas is in a hot tub of water. So if the gas is down here, I can kind of open the uh, piston and let it expand. And while it expands, I will do it slowly. I will let it expand, and as it's doing slowly, because it had gone fast, its temperature would have gone down. But this first part right here is the isotherm. So I really could let it expand slowly. That's why I said it doesn't really make a good practical engine because I'm, I'm slow about it. But I, but I could actually build it. So in that sense, it's not just an abstract discussion. I, this can actually happen. And so I can make it get up to this point B, right? And then at that point, maybe I'll close the, the, the uh, mo motion here and take it out of the hot bath, okay? And it, it, it still at this point is, is not only hot, but they're still under quite a bit of pressure. So when I get into the room here, then I can release it. And now it's going to expand really quickly. And this is this part. This is the adiabatic expansion. And so in that part, as it expands, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it will expand to the pressure in this room. If I also had just designed it just right, as it expands, it will also cool to the temperature of this room. That's the hard thing to actually do. But if I actually did that, then it would be at point C here. Then what I can do is now begin to squeeze it slowly at, in the room. Because if, again, if I squeeze it slowly in the room like this, I am getting its volume smaller. And you would have thought, because if I would have squeezed it fast, it would have warmed up. But the whole point of doing it slowly is the heat is coming out. So this is Q coming out. This was the Q going in. And I think that's what you were saying. Where's the Q? There, this is, there is a Q going in. It's not necessarily burning the fuel like we saw on the fast ones, because we wanted to get it really hot and things to happen really quick. Okay, but there is a heat going in and a heat going out. And so as I slowly compress it, making sure its temperature doesn't go out, that's when the heat's coming out into the room. Of course, then I get to this point here, and what I'm going to do there then is compress it really quick. And so once I get to this point here, I'll go. And again, if everything's set up just right, I can squeeze it so much that it warms up to the same as the bath. So then I can quickly put it in the bath and it's now in the same temperature of the bath and I can go through the cycle. So can it be built? Yes. Uh, everything's got to be just right. That's why, you know, like I said, it's only going to work for the ideal case. And, but, it, but it's worth discussing, especially since, well, my minus sign error here, I, you know, it, it leads to this idea of what is the calculation? What is the formula for entropy? And what is the second law of thermodynamics? Yeah. As far as engines and materials, what is limiting us from getting closer to that, like the speed of our reactions? What is limiting us? Well, well, no. You, it, it's it's how you remember. Remember in this cycle, we uh, had two adiabatic processes and two isovolumetrics. Okay. Now that wasn't the same as this cycle. This cycle had two isotherms and two adiabatics. Okay. So we probably, you know, to make it more efficient, we want to follow this cycle closer than this cycle. Because if everything worked perfect, if we built the engine as perfectly as we possibly could, we are still operating in a cycle. Remember, the efficiencies and the heat are calculated based upon what path do we take. So these, this path being different than that path results in a different efficiency. So you might argue that, well, this is not the best path to go down. Agreed, totally agreed. But this path is going to be so slow that I'm not going to make an engine out of it. That's what I mean. How can we make it faster? Like what's stopping us? Well, it is the isotherm process. This isotherm process needs to be done relatively slow. Is that limited by the materials, thermal conductivity, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So if our thermal conductivity would, would increase and in our yeah, yeah. So I, I see what you're getting at, yeah. So we could uh, have it a little faster with better thermal conductivity. So sure. Perhaps, yeah, 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 you know. As we always say, you know, graphene is the answer for everything, right? It's going to build our efficient engines. It's going to make us fly around the world. It's going to solve all of our energy needs. Yeah, it's the miracle. No, <laughs> I am joking because we love to say that. But, but you're right. It has all these wonderful properties in terms of strength and thermal conductivity. So maybe we will get more to that. Right. And the likewise, the diesel engine has a different efficiency because the process was different. One was isobaric, the other one was isovolumetric, and then two adiabatics. And so we ended up with a different path and therefore a different calculation in terms of its e efficiency. And it, and it tends to be generally more efficient than, than this, but not as efficient as, as that. So yes, yeah, so we want to gear you know, towards as much as we can the Carnot cycle but also have to be realistic with time frames and the materials we have to work with. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyways, it looks like I got myself all twisted up here, but I wanted to say this was the last part of the chapter. That what the second law of thermodynamics is, is simply this. When heat comes out, we do have to obey the first law of thermodynamics, but we also have to obey the second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics simply says this, that if this is your environment here, okay, and I take energy out of this hot environment, this is how I would calculate the change in entropy. It comes out here and goes into here. So this number and this number, when put together, and there's the minus sign error, need to be at least the same number at best, or perhaps this number being a little bit bigger, so when I'm all done, when it's all said and done, then this world has more entropy at the end than when I began. And so, unlike the conservation of energy, where it says, what is the energy before equal? Energy at the end. Here, what is the entropy at the end compared to the beginning? The entropy at the end is greater than the entropy at the beginning. And so it's not just that the entropy at the beginning equals the entropy at the end. It's that the entropy at the end is greater than the entropy at the beginning. And that's what the second law of thermodynamics is. And so in instead of focusing on the engine, I should have focused on the environment. And like I said, I, th I think that's the, the negative sign there. That makes a lot of sense. And then, and then your question then about the equation is this. Watch, watch this. Here's the, the first and easiest example of looking at the second law of thermodynamics. It's the same discussion we had last Thursday. If I came over here and I put a hot object next to a cold object, okay? Uh, do I, I don't have uh, two objects anymore here, but last time I had two blocks. But if this was hot and this was cold and I put them together, heat goes which way? <laughs> okay, we said that the Q flows this way, from the hot one to the cold one. And I ask this question, could <laughs> it flow from the cold one to the hot one? Why can't five joules, and I, I'm talking about net five joules, I know there's always random collisions, and so at any given instant there are some situations where energy would always be flowing from the cold one to the hot one. But why is it that it always goes from the hot one to the cold one? How come we can't let the cold one get colder, lose energy, and the hot one get hotter? Right, and it's a second law of thermodynamics is the reason. You could not give me an argument from the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is 
satisfied if you say five joules of energy come out of the cold one and go into the hot one. The cold one getting colder and the hot one getting hotter is a conservation of energy. Just like the hot one losing five and the cold one gaining five is a conservation of energy. So there is nothing in the first law of thermodynamics, there is nothing that you have been taught up to this point in your education that would say, why can't the cold one get colder? And as you guys pointed out last time, it's just more of a random chance, isn't it? I mean, if you look at a bunch of molecules colliding around, oh, what's the likelihood of the faster ones hitting the slower ones? And of course, the faster ones slowing down and the colder ones or the slow ones speeding up seems very likely to me. But the chance of a slow one hitting a fast one just right to make it go even faster? I, I'm, I'm trying to think of how you would even do that. I, Let's see, if this one's going real fast, and this one's slow, it seems very likely, oh yeah, and this one's going to slow down. That makes sense to me. But how is this fast moving one going to hit this one and make it go even slower? Okay, so, 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 oh, so, so maybe if it did this, maybe if this one came all the way over like this, right? And then it was just starting to go back when this one came over. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe kind of a. <laughs> so, so maybe there's a few chances that it could happen, right? But how likely is it to happen? Very unlikely. So when this happens billions and, and, and billions is even small. When this happens trillions and trillions of times, what's going to happen overall is what? This is going to move to here. And I claim that that is buried in that little formula of entropy. Watch this. If we look at the change of entropy of this one, what is the change of entropy of the hot one. And if you'll allow me now to throw some calculus in here, I will say dH sub s. What is the change of entropy for the hot one? And what I'm trying to say is that the entropy will be calculated as a Q over a T. So, if the small amount of energy that flows at that instance, we'll just say one microsecond, how much energy flows, call it dQ, then this hot object would still really be hot. It hasn't really cooled down. So I'll just say that that's, that's the first little microscopic movement of, of energy, if you will. What would be the change of entropy of the cold object? Well, if you again will allow me to now introduce the, to the calculus world and say, okay, at that microscopic moment, then that same amount of energy would flow in to the cold one. And its temperature would be T sub C. Now let's look at these numbers here for a moment. As I look at these numbers here, then this number, T um, bummer, I got the same silly sign problem. No? Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. So this number, ah, okay, yeah. So this number here is, of course, the same as that number. And that's, that's what I want to say. The, the two Qs are the same. That's our conservation of, of energy. But as I look closely at this, then 
these, this number here, the cold one, is smaller than the hot one. And so if I were to compare this one to this one, let's compare the signs first. What's the sign of this one? It's positive, right? Energy goes in, positive number. What's the sign of this one? It's negative. Energy comes out. So that's a negative number, and that's a positive number. Then, which one of these, in terms of absolute value, is bigger? This one, the cold one, right? And so this, the positive number, is a little bit bigger than that one. So when I add up all the changes of entropy, and again, if you'll allow me to do some calculus, add up all the changes of entropy, I would have a Q over TH, and I would add that to a Q over a um, TC. If I think of this in terms of the absolute value, remember coming out of them is a negative, so that's a negative 1 over TH, and that's a plus 1 TC. This then would be my summation, well, summation, summation, of my change in entropy. Or on a microscopic differential scale here, this would be a dq absolute value, a negative 1 over th minus, a plus, sorry, a t c. And so is this a positive number or is this a negative number? Well, as you already said, this number is more or bigger than this number is negative. And so when you add up what happens here, what do you come out with? Greater than zero. What if the energy tried to flow the other way around? What would happen there? <laughs> right. The other way around, as the energy goes from there to there, each of these would change signs, and what you would have is a change of entropy that is less than zero. And so what I would say here is we cannot put a hot and cold object together and the cold one get colder because that would violate the second law of thermal dynamics. The first law of thermal dynamics is still valid if energy goes from here to here, but the second law is not. And so what we have using the two laws, is the amount of energy that flows from the hot one to the cold one is the same, first law of thermodynamics, and the energy will always go from the hot one to the cold one, second law of thermodynamics. And that's really the main point in the end of the chapter. Yeah, question? Um, why is the T cold greater than T hot? Well, that's what I meant by hot. Hot is th uh, 400 Kelvin. Cold is 300 Kelvin. So one over the hot one, 400, is a smaller number than one over 300. How does this work on a large scale? When you start talking about stars and the gravity of the things compressing. Wouldn't the energy? Okay, so. Again, back to this whole idea of what really then is entropy on a microscopic level, okay? Because I want you to see two things here. And I, 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 like I said, I think it's the hardest, personally for me, I think it's the hardest thing we cover in all three semesters of here. Other people don't agree with that. They, they think magnetism and Faraday's law is, and, and, and maybe that's true. But for me, it's just this visual picture of entropy here and the fact that the second law of thermodynamics says this, that it says if you add up all the change of entropies, you get something greater than or equal to zero. You, you don't get zero. And so it's very different than any of the other conservational principles. I know if I lose energy on one thing or if I lose momentum, the loss of that energy or momentum is equal to what's gained over there. And so I have an equality instead of an inequality.
quality. Okay, but the point I'm trying to get at here is entropy really is then a randomness to your molecules. How much molecular chaos do you have? The example I was trying to do earlier uh, on uh, Thursday was, look at these pennies. Is there any force out there that is stopping these pennies from landing on all heads? And the only thing is, is statistical chance. And that's a little different than, say, the force of gravity. If I were to hold these in my hand and, well, just let them go, I don't want to lose them too far, but if I just let them go, what are the chances that they go up versus going down? You would say, oh, they're going to go down because of the force of gravity. The laws of physics tell us that it goes down. Okay, fair enough. But there is no other law of physics that says I can't get all heads, and yet, I got four out of the six heads. If I did it again, I get two heads. If I do it again, I get three heads. It, it almost seems like there's some additional force out there. Two heads. Oh, three heads. Darn. One. Three, four heads. Anything stopping me from getting all six heads? No. Other than statistical chance. And that's what this entropy is. And so it is a randomness. And so you're beginning to see that as we moved energy from here to here, these started going faster. These had more of a random motion to them. They increased their randomness by this factor. These guys lost their randomness. They slowed down by this factor. But the total sum is that these became more random than these became organized and there is nothing that says it has to be that way. It's statistical chance. And so the universe, we like to say, because of the second law, is just getting more random and more random and more random. You gave me an example of what? Uh, astrophysics here? You said what? Uh, stars coming together? No, no. Higher temperature than like this guy. As this warms up, that is more entropy. I mean, the system, you have, you have a concentration of heat and then cold on the outside, so that would have less entropy than an even distribution. No. No, you wouldn't. No, no, no. You, 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 you take a bunch of rocks, and you have a big randomness to those rocks. But when they come together, you would say, okay, they came together. That's more organized. Fair enough. But they'll come together with such a huge force that this planet that's forming will be at a very high temperature. And the motion of those individual molecules will have more of a randomness than the separate dust pieces. Yeah. And so if you, you yeah, beyond the scope of this class, but if you calculate the entropy of a formation of a planet, it is more disorganized because it's very hot. So we can never have Well, in a, in a perfect, slow-moving, what we call irreversible uh, process, it actually is equal to zero. So there are cases, and the Carnot cycle is an example of where it comes out to be exactly zero. That's why when I mentioned that, hey, the entropy can never be, or the efficiency can never be more efficient than the Carnot cycle, this is why. The Carnot cycle, the entropy change will be zero. And the best you could do with any other cycle would be exactly the same. In fact, that's my first example. Actually, my second example. Let, let's do this for a moment. As a good example in terms of calculation. Did you have a question? What if I put 100 grams of ice at zero degrees and I leave it in the room for the next hour and that ice not only melts but then it warms up to room temperature which we'll call it 22 degrees in here what's the change of entropy of that ice well let's give it a shot here 
now that we have something we can actually calculate here and hopefully have a better picture here of the entropy, let's actually calculate it here. Maybe I'll draw a picture, but I'm going to start here with ice at an initial temperature of zero degrees Celsius. It will take some time, but this 100 grams of ice is soon going to melt and become 100 grams of water. Now its temperature will still be zero degrees Celsius once it breaks its bonds. Because then, once all the bonds have been broken, this 100 grams of water will warm up and will eventually get to 22 degrees Celsius, right? And so we could ask ourselves, what is the change of entropy of just the ice alone? Next we'll add the room because isn't it the room that's warming up the, the ice? So we'll add that. But for right now, let's just look at this ice that is warming up here. And so I've got this chunk of ice. It is warming up. And there's really two processes. First, it's breaking the bonds. So I brought this out here to kind of show you. This is what it would look like right now. When it melts, it looks like this. Do you think that'd be an increase or decrease in entropy? Increase. Why? Because the ice is more organized and now the water's like all jumbled up. All right. Good. And I heard both answers. On a molecular picture, just looking at this, this looks organized. This looks unorganized. The entropy is a measurement of how unorganized the physical world is. And so, when we go from here to here, that looks more disorganized. I heard another answer that say, well, the energy goes in, right? Q is going in. Q is a positive number. And that too would tell me entropy here is going to be a positive number. And so for both reasons, I would say there is a positive change to our entropy. All right, so in this part here, I have something that goes like this. What is the change of entropy? I guess it would be the sum of the change of entropy. And let's just talk about the melting of the ice here for a moment because my first calculation is just to say Q over the temperature. Maybe I'll give myself some more working room here. But this first step where we are melting I would get the change of entropy is, and what's nice about this integral is what would you say about the temperature during this melting process? Yeah, it is a constant and nothing's better than doing an integral with constants. You gotta love it, right? Pull it out in front. And so this just becomes a Q over T. So that's the easiest one you can do. And in this case, it would be ML over T. And if we put that number in here, the M is 100 grams. The latent heat of fusion is it's 80 calories, but how many? Is that 335? 333? Three, three, three. Three, 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 three joules per gram. And our temperature is 273 Kelvin. And so when I put this all in, I'm going to get a number that number one is, is positive, as I would expect. Energy is going in. And it measures the increased randomness that I have. And look at the units. This is our first calculation of entropy, but this would be then the units of entropy. It would be energy per Kelvin. Kind of makes sense. Back to our definition of entropy, it would be energy in the numerator and Kelvin in the denominator. So if I go 100 times 333 divided by 273, I get a change of 122 
joules per Kelvin. Again, notice a positive number. Okay. Now let's keep going because we haven't got there yet, but this will soon melt. And once it melts, then what happens? <laughs> yeah, now it's going to warm up. And so let me ask the same question. Will this come out to be a positive number or a negative number? Positive. Why would you say positive number as we warm it up? Good, I heard both answers again. One answer, the math answer, is you are adding energy to it. The Q is a positive number. Yes. The microscopic reason. These molecules are now bouncing around faster and faster and there, there's a more randomness to them. And that might be a harder one to see. But that's the difference between something going real slow or real fast. They hit more often. They, they go in more directions more often times. And that is considered a more randomness to it. So a higher temperature is a measure of its randomness. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the latent heat of fusion. Yeah, it's 80 calories. 4.18. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm going to add the environment in a minute. Yeah. But at this point, yes, I'm ignoring the environment. I'm just, just, just looking at the ice itself. Okay, so here there's an increase of the entropy, but as you said, now the room's got to be getting colder. So that's going to be a decrease in entropy in the room, so I do want to make sure we, we, we see that. Because notice the second law of thermodynamics is not saying you can, everything has to increase in entropy, right? It's saying the net result of everything you do has to be an increase. So as something cools down, which is going to be a decrease in entropy, something else is warming up which will be an increase in entropy. And at best, those will be the same. But most likely, there will be more of an increase in entropy than there is a decrease. And you're going to see that in this example here in just a second. But we can decrease entropy with outside work, right? Well, okay, again, not... Okay, I can decrease entropy. For example, uh, a refrigerator is a good example of that. I take, you know, my leftovers from the kitchen table, I go and I put them in the refrigerator. Those molecules of that food are now going slower. They have a decrease in entropy. But what happened in the process? I increased the environment and through the process of the refrigerator, and I can feel it on my feet when I stand there barefooted, the compressor in there is blowing hot air. It's taking energy out of the refrigerator and putting it into the kitchen. And so the kitchen is warming up increasing in entropy. My food is cooling down and decreasing in entropy, but if I calculated it, I would find that the increase of entropy in the kitchen is greater than the decrease of entropy of my cooling food. And that's what I want to see, see here. This is both a uh, warming and a cooling. Okay. But those of you who said it, said it right here. There would be right here an increase in entropy again. And so let's look at the warming process. How would I do a warming process? Again, the change in entropy would be an integral of ds, which is an integral of qdt. Here's what makes this a little harder. What about the temperature? It's changes, right? So it's really nice doing an integral. When the temperature was a constant, we just pulled it out. But you guys are very sophisticated with your calculus. You're not going to have any trouble. So what do we need to do? We need to somehow write Q in the form of T, right? And we do have that, right? We have the specific heat. We have the MCDT would be the change in energy uh, when you just added a little bit of energy to this chunk of, of water. And so we would have then the MC and then we would have an integral of DT over T which would then be an MC natural log of, and if we start with some initial temperature and go to some final temperature, this would be TF over T initial. And so a little harder calculation, granted, but not certainly beyond you, just okay, this is the entropy of what's going on in this, in this process. Okay. And now if I put in some numbers here, what do I get? Let's see, I have 100 grams 
of water. Uh, what's the specific heat of water? 4.18 joules per gram for... Okay, each change of Celsius, is it okay if I change it to each degree of... Kel I can't say degree. Each Kelvin, <laughs> right? So that my units and this are all going to be in Kelvin? Okay. And then I have the natural log of... Well, it's going to start at 273, and if it warms up to 22 Celsius, uh, does that make 95? Okay. And so there is my change in entropy as measured from the warming up of the, of the ice. And so if I grab my calculator here, I've got 100 times 4.18 times a natural log of 295 over a 273. And so there is an additional increase of 32.4 here. But again, notice it's a positive number. Right? Warming up. Yeah. What do you mean Q varies? When you took the integral of the first one with respect to Q, you just got Q out. You didn't get Q, you didn't, it was like an indefinite integral. You didn't put Q final and Q initial. Oh, here? Yeah, and then oh. the next one you would respect, you would integrate with respect to T. Well, I, I guess I did. I could say from beginning to end. Um, um, from some initial energy it has to some final. Because even though it's ice, doesn't it have a lot of energy? I mean, it's zero degrees ice, but those molecules are still moving pretty fast. So this would probably be more appropriately written as delta Q. But in this book, we never write delta Qs. All Qs are delta Qs. So your author, that's why our first law of thermodynamics to me looks kind of funny. Because he uses the delta for the change in internal energy, but he doesn't use the delta for the work, because these always represent changes. But that's how he, that's how he writes it. So yes, I really did do a, a delta Q there. Yeah. Okay, so this would be the total change of entropy of the ice as it warms up during this next hour. What about the room? Right, it's going to lose entropy, right? So let's add the room into this equation here and say what's going on with the room. Now I picked the room because this is a very big room compared to that chunk of ice. I don't think it's going to cool down the room very much. So will it be okay if I just treat the room as the same temperature? I mean, it may lower it from 22 to 21.9999, okay? And so if this was a smaller object, and we'll do some examples with smaller objects, but at the beginning here, it's probably easier to do the math by just saying the temperature doesn't change in the room. Because what did you notice about calculating entropies? When the temperature doesn't change? <laughs> it's really quite simple, all right? So let's do the room. The room then would be a delta S then of our room, which is going to be an integral of dS, which is an integral of dQ over T, which, if you're willing to accept the fact that the room isn't really going to change much, I can pull it out and say, look, what is happening is there is a decrease in entropy, sure. How much? Well, that would be, and if you want, I can write this as a Q over T, if you prefer a delta Q over T, however you want to look at it. But that would be the change in entropy of this room. I need to find out how much energy then left the room. And if it left it, it's a negative number. So as you said earlier, the change in entropy is going to be a negative number. The molecules in this room will be more organized. They will slow down, albeit very little, because there's so many of them, but they will be a little more 
organized here. And what's kind of nice about this is I can go back to the first law of thermodynamics. What do I know about the amount of energy that comes from the room? It must be equal to the energy that went into the ice. So, even though I'm talking about the room here, I'm going to put MLF plus MC delta T to calculate the energy. This is the energy that actually went into the ice. Right? But it's also the energy that came out of the room. So if I give myself a positive number for what goes into the ice, I will put a negative in front of that to represent this is what came out of the room. And so taking advantage of the first law of thermodynamics as I'm calculating here the second law of thermodynamics. And the temperature of the room is 295 or maybe it'll cool down to 2, I can't even imagine going down to 294, but you know, I don't know, if you want to do the middle, 294.5, you know. And, Right, right. So this is, this is both. This is the energy here and again the energy here. So this will be the whole next hour as this thing cools down. So if I put in some numbers here, starting maybe in the numerator, this number, 100 grams times 333, is 33,300 joules there. That's the piece or the energy that's going to come from the room to break the bonds and melt it. Uh, in addition to that, I have the warming up. And so this is the 100 times 4.18 times a 22 degrees of warming up. So there's another 9,196 joules as I warm it up. And you can see, you know, light and heat diffusion is huge. I mean, that's where most of the energy is, right, to, to break the bonds. Doesn't take nearly as much to warm it up. You can see that in the entropy, too. There was much more increase in entropy by breaking the bonds uh, than there was here in making them go a little bit faster. And then if I divide that by the 295 Kelvin, I get what? So add 33300 zero, zero in the numerator, divide that by 295, and I get a negative 144. So again, negative because we are cooling down. And then if I finish this problem, trying to emphasize the second law of thermodynamics here, uh, this should be 100 times 333 joules right here, this, this number right there. And so the change in entropy, I'll call total, your author does this, change of entropy of the universe. <laughs> so not just looking at the ice by itself, or not looking at the room by itself, but looking at everything involved, the change of entropy of the universe, we can add these all together. So we have a 122 for the breaking of the bonds. We have another 32.4 for the warming of the water. That loss of energy coming from the room means the room molecules have slowed down and are a little more organized by that much. But when it's all said and done, the 122 plus the 32.4 minus the 144 comes out to be a positive 10.4 joules per Kelvin. So this whole process means that we are going to finish the experiment with more disorganized than organized, right? Nothing magical about making it melt. It's just melting is a more likely scenario than not melting, right? And that's what the second law of thermodynamics is. What can and cannot happen. What will not happen is that my ice will get colder and the room will get warmer.
If we calculated that, we would see that that requires a change of entropy that is a negative number. And so that is unlikely to happen. Highly unlikely to happen. Statistical odds. And even these pennies, which as you guys pointed out last time, I mean me getting all heads here, I should be able to get all heads at least one time out of 64. And so maybe someday, time before this semester's over, I will get all heads. One, two, three. Nope. Still not going to get it. Oh, one head, two heads. I would be happy with just all tells. One, two, three, four heads. Darn. Right? And so, again, not that there's any kind of magical force out there. And I think that's what makes the second law of thermodynamics really a little bit harder to grasp. People say, oh, you can't do that because you don't have enough energy. Oh, you can't do that because you don't have enough momentum. Oh, you can't do that because it's just unlikely. <laughs> and it just doesn't have that same push. But it's nonetheless true when these odds are you've got more molecules. If you can see the speck of dust with your human eye, if you don't need a a, 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 a microscope, so much smaller than this, but if you can see that speck of dust, you've got more atoms than you've got grains of sand on the entire earth. There's a lot of atoms bouncing around. And the chances are very, very unlikely that anything other than a large statistical probability take place, as we talked about last time. It's, it's possible I'm going to win the lottery. But highly, highly unlikely. So unlikely, I feel like every time I buy a lotto ticket, there's something against me. I know, it's those Greek gods that are out there. And they're opposing everything I do. And they're not going to allow it to happen. But it's just, it's just a random chance. Does that randomness uh, become a, a factor when you have CPUs that are in the 20 nanometer uh, yeah, 20 nanometers is still pretty big, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can get, this This does, as you get to the point of smaller and smaller things, in fact, a good friend of mine, that was his whole PhD thesis, is he, you know, like working with two pennies, <laughs> what are the chances of getting heads with two pennies? Not two tails. I didn't get two heads. Ah, two heads. Got it already. Right? So with a small number here, you could still say that the odds are 50-50, but 50-50 out of what chances? Right? One in billions and billions? Or one in four? As this. Yeah, and so, yes, he, he worked with, uh, his specialty was sodium atoms, but he had 20 sodium atoms. And there were many experiments where he would recognize that if he took 20 sodium atoms at a high temperature and 20 atoms at a low temperature and he put them together, the cold one actually got colder and the hot one actually got hotter. So he used sodium. Um, and there were reasons for the sodium, but uh, yeah. But sodium was one that they could control really well and count the number of atoms, 20. They did a lot of 10s and 20s. Yeah, but mu that's much bigger than nanoscales, yeah. I mean, smaller than nanoscales, yeah. How, how could you, like, possibly know you have 20 atoms in the so small? How did he know he had, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'll send him an email. How did he know he had 20? Uh, that was a good question. I guess I never asked him that. How many grams? <laughs> yeah, how many grams? Are you? Yeah, I don't know how he measured the 20. He might have used it. He, he might, it might have been the mass spectrometer. Yeah, because he, he certainly used it a lot. Yeah. I mean, just, just how do you move it around? How do you control it? How do you split off 20? Is tough experimental uh, techniques. And the, of course, then that's, you know, why it's a PhD thesis, right? I mean, just this whole idea where in the world we are currently in, moving around one atom at a time and controlling one atom or groups of 20 atoms is amazing. You never had that before in history, and now we do, and now we can. Not easy. I can't do it, but <laughs> we don't have any equipment here to do it. 
but uh, you guys will soon be at the university where you there will be equipment that does do that nearby. So. The thing is that we don't use things at that small, that small scale with the 20 and 20, and how it got colder, how the cold one got colder and the hot the one got hotter. Yeah. So, but we don't work with those kinds of like. We don't yet. So. <laughs> right? That's why it's part of uh, science research before it becomes engineering, before it becomes technology. Yeah. But that's kind of that whole development phase. You got to do the science. From the science, you got to do the, the engineering of it. And then if you get the technology right, then it becomes something you're going to hold in your hand. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't that long ago where, you know, you know, I mean, people were, I mean, this whole spintronics world that has just totally revolu revolutionized the world of electronics. I mean, maybe about 10 years ago, spintronics really hit on. But 15 years ago, it was just fun toys in the lab. And it's like, really? Does anybody really care about the spin of the electron? And it's just the current, right? No. And you would not have the hard drives that we have today without spintronics. So there's the future. It's not electronics. It's spintronics, right? All right. Well, I wanted to do as many examples as I could. I uh, spent a little longer on that uh, discussion than I had really a a anticipated here. Um, but maybe I can also do some more entropy calculations as well as some other heat engine ones here as we get to the uh, uh, end of this uh, chapter here. Uh, I like number four as a good one. It's a good discussion on efficiencies and energies. Uh, it doesn't really have entropy in it, but uh, that's okay. We'll, we'll come back to some that have a good entropy. And here's what it says. It says a multi-cylinder gasoline engine in an airplane operates at 2,500 revolutions per minute and it takes in 7.5 eight nine times ten to the three joules of energy and exhausts four point five eight times ten to the three joules for every revolution of the crank shaft so the engine looks something like this I'll just draw a little picture and say okay here's the engine we don't know how many cylinders it has we did have this discussion on the auto cycle here but what we are saying here is heat is flowing in QH and the first part of this problem clearly states that it is 7.89 times 10 to the 3 joules in one revolution. And so as the crankshaft goes around once, uh, we would be burning some fuel. Obviously, as we saw, the crankshaft has to go around twice before the, each cylinder fires, but some of the cylinders will fire, and so in one revolution, half of the cylinders will fire, and that's how much energy goes in from this burning fuel. That's what they're saying. Obviously, the point of the engine is to do some work, but unfortunately, because of entropy, we can't get all of it out and so we are going to have some heat energy flow out and in this case they say that the energy that is exhausted is 5.48 no I'm sorry 4.58 is that right yeah 4.58 times 10 to the third joules in one revolution They don't say anything about the temperatures here, so we can't really do any entropy with it, and they're not even asking entropy. But what they are asking here in A is, how many liters of fuel does this engine burn in one hour if the heat of combustion is 4.03, 4.03 times 10 to the 7 liters or uh, seven joules for every liter of fuel you burn and so I'll start here here is step A alright step A is we know this we know that there is 7.89 times 10 to the 3 joules per revolution and they're asking really how many liters per hour so I guess the first thing I do is say, well, I know that the plane is operating 
at 2,500 revolutions per minute. So when I multiply those two, the revolutions cancel, and so now I'm going to get number of joules per minute that is burned. Now they want to know per hour, so let me go and then do 60 minutes in one hour. And so that's going to be the number of joules per hour. Yeah, yeah, and the problem, yeah, in the problem it said that the engine was operating at 2,500 RPMs. Say, so, okay, what is it? Okay. And then, the last piece here is that I know that one liter <coughs> has an energy of 4.03 times 10 to the seventh joules and so starting with energy per revolution, knowing the revolutions, knowing the time in an hour, knowing the energy, I should be able to finish here with a conversion and so this is just a unit conversion of how many liters per hour is this plane using. So 7.89 times 10 to the third times 2,500 times 60 and then divided by 4.03 times 10 to the seventh coming out to be 29.4 liters per hour. So there's my fuel consumption. And obviously, if I'm a pilot, I would care a lot about my fuel consumption, <laughs> knowing at what rate am I consuming fuel so that I don't run out of fuel up in the air. It's not quite the same as a car when you run out of gas in a car. It's a little more serious when you're in a player plane. And actually, I saw this one time. I, it was actually, wasn't that long ago, too. It was about a year and a half ago. It wasn't quite two years ago. I'm driving home, just got off the freeway, and this plane... Whoa! Could have been more than 25 feet above me and landed in the baseball field right there. So sh pulled into the high school. 19 year old kid comes out. I thought I had enough fuel to make it to Santa Paula and I, I, I just left uh, San Inez and I was supposed to get to Santa Paula. And anyways, got over Ventura and ran out of fuel. <laughs> so whew, so he, uh, he missed that. All together. So, well, he, any, any, any plane wreck that you walk away from is safe. Uh, his, his plane didn't do so well. I, I wonder if he got it working again because the hard landing split the landing gear in pieces. So then he slid on his belly, the wing went down, spun around, and the wing came off. And so they had to truck the plane, you know, on a big flatbed truck to get it out of the school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There was a team of Little League there going, the coach all, get over here, over here, <laughs> lands in the outfield at the Little League field. <laughs> That's it. Uh, he, he, he was shaken up, and as he should be, <laughs> I mean, so, missed, uh, missed that one. Uh, B, what is the mechanical output of this engine? Mechanical, sorry, mechanical, yeah, mechanical power output of this engine. And so this is part of the big reason I wanted you to see. If, if, if you put this much energy in and this much energy comes out, don't you know how much work is being done? All right, so work per time would really be the heat per time minus the heat per time. The heat going in and minus the heat coming out. And so that's the, the work. In fact, maybe it might be a little bit easier to see if I just drop the time here for a moment and just write it as that way. Because this going in is 7.89 times 10 to the third joules per revolution. And if we subtract off what comes out of the tailpipe and the cooling system, 
the 4.58 times 10 to the third joules per revolution, that would be the amount of work per revolution. So then if I multiply it by the 2500 revolutions in one minute, that would then be the joules per minute. Now if they're asking for power, I should probably do it per second. So let me put 60 seconds in a minute and that's going to give me my joules per second, which we call a, a watt. And so there would be the power in watt. So 7.89 minus 4.58 all of that times a thousand would be the work. Multiply that by 2,500, divide that by 60, and we are looking at 137,917 watts. Maybe I'll make one more step here. I know that there is one horsepower is equal to 746 watts. So if I divide that by 746, we're looking at 185 horsepower engine here. And so here's the horsepower, which I think they actually even said that. It says, ignore the frictional effects of the rest of the engine and give your answer in horsepower. So I did ignore all the other factors that all of that's not here is here and then listed it in, in horsepower. So 185 horsepower is the power rating of the engine. And again, notice it's based upon the heat. As this problem continues on, it says, what then is the torque exerted on the crankshaft? Well, maybe this is more of a mechanics question at this point, but we'll have to go back to physics 121. Power is torque times the angular speed, or torque is power divided by angular speed. So the power was this 137,917 watts. And if I divide by its speed, 2,500. Of course, they have it in revolutions per minute, but we know that there are two pi radians per revolution, and we also know that there is 60 seconds in a minute. So if we do a little unit conversion downstairs, we will get the correct units for torque in Newton meters. So how much torque is being applied by that, that engine here. Uh, maybe I'll do the denominator first. 2,500 times 2 times pi times, oh, divide by 60. And so the denominator is about 262 uh, radians per second. So 137, 917 divided by the angular speed gives me a torque of about 527 newton meters that would be on the propeller here. That of course has got a push against the air which is making the whole airplane go go forward. And so there's my heat engine tied together with my mechanics of Physics 121. Um, and there's a part D, but I'm going to stop with that one. Since it's again a little more mechanics than I'm interested in. Hopefully you haven't forgotten your mechanics, but let's go to 14. 14 is a back efficiencies again here, and it says this. 
It says a power plant actually operates at 32% efficient during the summer when the seawater is at 20 degrees Celsius. Oh, that would be nice. Not here. All right. The plant uses steam at 350 degrees Celsius to drive its turbines. If the plant's efficiency changes by the same proportion as the ideal efficiency when winter hits and the seawater drops to 10 degrees Celsius, what is the new efficiency in the winter? Okay, so let's start here. They start with this idea that they tell us the real efficiency is 32%. But I picked this problem to ask then, what would be the ideal efficiency? Are we ever going to really get 100% of the energy out? No. Why not? Second law of thermodynamics. So, we would never be shooting for 100% e efficiency. That would just be a foolish understanding of our science. But we should be shooting for the most efficient that it can allow us under the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And in this case, particularly the second law of thermodynamics. So, the Carnot efficiency we derived last time and wrote on the board today as 1 minus that ratio of the temperatures. So let's see how close we are because what they are saying here is our steam is operating at 350 degrees Celsius. And so that, oh that's our high temperatures, sorry. That would be our high temperature. And so we warm up that steam quite a bit obviously and then we let it expand out the turbines. And it is expanding and cooling and then they say it cools down to the seawater temperature. That's a very misleading because it, the truth is you're never going to have a power plant to cool that much because by that time it's water. It's not expanding gases anymore. So you're not going to cool below a hundred. But I think they are saying if we could, you know, what would be the ideal efficiency? Because we're cooling it down with the seawater, which they said in summertime is 20 degrees. So this was the this would be the most that we could possibly hope for, and not with water, because like I said, water at this point is going to be a liquid. And in fact, most turbines they don't even get close to even 100 degrees, because then you get too many droplets of water on your turbines, and that etches your surface, and then you really lose efficiency after a couple of weeks of that. So, they, they but anyways, so but this would be the efficiency of a perfect operation where we didn't worry about the water condensing. We just had a temperature difference of this is how high we heat it probably based on our materials falling apart and then this is what we cool it down based upon our our seawater here. So if I take the 273 and add the 20 divide it by the 273 added to the 350 and then I go 1 minus that number we're looking at about 53% Okay, so we would never expect to get more than 53%, but we could at least shoot for 53%, right? That, that will be our goal. And so what we have built, according to this, is it's operating at 32%. We could get it as much as 53%. So got a lot of room for improvement still. And obviously, like I said, a big one is the, the whole idea that you're not going to have a gas getting it as cold as the, as the ocean. But what would happen then in the winter time? And so maybe I should put summer here because then I would have an ideal efficiency in the winter. And so one thing I hope you caught in here, but it's a big reason I picked this problem, the Carnot efficiency, right? is not like a set number 
I can't say, oh, the, the best efficiency you're ever going to get is 75%. I, I wish I could. If we didn't have the second law of thermodynamics, we would easily say, from the first law, the best we're going to get is 100%. And we have a number to work with, no matter what. But we don't. The efficiency is based upon what? Difference. Yeah, the temperatures that you're going to operate in. And so your efficiency is really based on this. So you want this as low as possible and this as high as possible. And then obviously you're limited to the world around us. Uh, getting things too hot, our materials don't work. Uh, getting them too cold is also a challenge. Uh, we have to cool it to something around in the environment. And the environment like the ocean is a good option, but it's far from zero degrees here. So there's our option. Uh, we can build a refrigerator, but then we got the efficiencies of the refrigerator to add to the complexity of it. And so does that really help? Uh, usually not. So in this case, they're going to have a slightly different efficiency. There'll be a 10 for the cold water, but we will still probably heat it up just as much in the winter as we, as we do in the, in the summer. And so we've got our 373 plus 10, divide that by our 373 plus 350, 1 minus that answer, and it increases a little bit. Maybe I should have put 50... Now I'll put 53 oh there. And so this will go up to 54 6. You said 373. That's what you typed in. You probably had three, uh, three, 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. no, my mistake for trying to talk why I think. <laughs> for the temperature of the cold on the top, why is it 273 plus 20 or 273 plus 9? Oh, it's your converting Kelvin there. Right, and I, I, good. And another thing I should emphasize, watching these calculations, this was derived using the ideal gas law. And the ideal gas law, we have to use Kelvin scale. Right. So make sure you use this on the Kelvin scale. Right, right. Good point. Well, anyway, you can see that because of the lower temperature of the environment, we get a better ideal efficiency. And what they're trying to say is you may not actually build an engine that meets these ideal ones, but if you do build a real engine, you will also see an increase in your efficiencies when your temperature changes for the same reason the ideal one changes. So we would expect the winter time to be a little bit more efficient and they say increase by the same proportion. So what I get by that is my 32 in the summer, 0.53, is to my efficiency of my real engine in the winter compared to the 546. And so that is probably what they mean here in this problem. But my efficiency is going to increase by but the same percentage. And so I'm going to have a higher efficiency. Yeah. Does, does the Carnot cycle change? Does it change? I mean, is it significantly different if we don't, oh. don't pretend we have ideal gases? Well, <laughs> it depends how far from an ideal gas do you have. So, um, fortunately, most gases, unless you're close to their condensing points, really operate very close to an ideal gas. So, do, do real people use this in yeah. real jobs? In yeah. Real yeah, yeah. The modeling gases from the ideal gas law is, yeah, it do, does work. In fact, uh, and then there's other equations that take one step further. Um, I know you guys in chemistry go through that. You start with the ideal gas law, don't you? And then you put in a slight modifier in there for the size of the molecules. And then a slight modifier for the interaction between them. And, and you can add extra factors. And then re calculate this based on that information and get a more accurate calculation. But uh, like I said, if you're 
far away from the condensing point, the interaction is very small and the size of the molecule is very small. A given gas bouncing around, you could fit a thousand molecules between one molecule and another. So treating them as empty space, a lot of empty space between them and of, you know, small size works pretty good. All right, so looking at this, I would get an efficiency of, I guess, 0.32 times 0.546. Uh, that answer then divided by 0.53 and goes up to 33%. Yay. <laughs> All right, so I get, you know, one more percentage. But it's one more out of 32, so that's really a one part in 33. I mean, that's a three, yeah, that's three out of 33-ish, you know, that's 3% better. So, and considering you've done nothing new here, it's, it's great, you know, just, hey, seawater came in, you know, it's different different temperature of the seawater. It makes you think in the summertime that it might be worth your time to put a, put a, a deep pipe down and pay the cost of a deep pipe and get some cold water out during the summer and you know operate everything at a little better e efficiency but that's what this one is is all about here in in 14. Uh, let me try 20. 20 is the one that you asked earlier about it is a Carnot cycle it's a good one to talk about Carnot cycle and some entropy here also here but uh, number 20 says this it says the point A in a Carnot cycle of 2.34 moles of monoatomic gas has a pressure of 1400 kilopascals. And I'll just read the whole thing. Then it says a volume of 10 liters, a temperature of 720. The gas then expands isothermically to point B. It then expands adiabatically to point C where it has a volume of 24. Then, yeah, maybe I better start drawing. <laughs> All right. And so here's the description that they're saying. If I put this in a PV diagram, they're putting us right here at point A and they're letting it expand isothermically and then adiabatically. So this is B and this is C. And they say this, they said that the point A in the Carnot cycle of a gas with 2.34 moles And it's monoatomic. So maybe we've got helium here. It has a pressure of 1400, uh, what are the units here? 1400 kilopascals. And a volume of 10 liters. The temperature, do they really tell me the temperature too? All right, they tell me the temperature. 720, they're giving me way too much. Could have made this a hard problem, but okay. <laughs> All right, so the point A has this many moles, monoatomic, it has a pressure of 1400, has a volume of 10 liters, and at a temperature of 720. The gas then expands isothermically to B. Okay, so that was part of our Carnot cycle, that we would be expanding it with a constant temperature to B. They say nothing more at B other than they said that it expands to point B. Then it expands adiabatically to the point C where its volume is 24. In the liters. All right, so we do know something about C, its volume anyways. And then it is isothermically compressed back to point D. Well, that makes sense. There's point D, so there's our isotherm. And then, so let's say, said it's a Carnot cycle, I bet that next part is adiabatic. Um, what does it say here? An isotherm compression to point D where its volume is 15. Ah, so they actually give me some information about D. Its volume is 15. 
an adiabatic process returns the gas back to point A. Determine all the unknown pressures, temperatures, and volumes at each of these points. So, like the last chapter, I was trying to show you, this is a good time to set up a table and say, here's point A, here's point B, here's point C, here's point D. What is the pressure, the volume, and the temperature at each of these spots? What do we know? What do we not know? All right, well, they've given me a lot of information at A. At A, they gave me the pressure in kilopascals. They gave me volume in liter and temperature in Kelvin. So I'll start with A. I know the pressure is 1400. I know the volume is 10. I know the temperature is 720. What do I know about B? Yeah, there's the key to solving part of this problem is it's an isotherm expansion there so it's going to be the same temperature. Okay? However, I don't know those two. More on those in just a second. It expands then adiabatically to C. So what do I know at C? Okay. Its volume is 24. That's nice. Do I know its temperature? No. Do I know its pressure? No. Bummer. How about we jump down to D? What do I know at D? Volume. And would be the same temperature as C, but or I just said I, I don't have that either. Bummer. All right, so it looks like that's the given information. What do I do? <laughs> yeah, look for the things that are connecting here. And in my case, I would say, all right, I am connected, if you will, uh, A to B or A to D. And I would go A to D. What's nice about A to D is it's adiabatic. And what's nice about adiabatic is only two of the three are needed, right? We've got that gamma factor. And so the pressure at A times the volume at A at A raised to a factor of gamma would be the pressure at D times the volume at D to a factor of gamma. And so looking at these four, I know three, I can, should be able to get the pressure here. So this is 1400. This is 10. Uh, now we're going to th need to think a little bit about gamma. What's gamma? Yeah, it's CP over CV. And they said it was monoatomic. They said it was helium. So that's the five thirds. Right? Because three degrees of freedom and then add two more. So five halves over three halves reduced to five thirds. So this would be raised to a power of five thirds. This would be the pressure at D. I'll go ahead and put my math over here. This is the volume at D, which we know is 15. Again, raised to a factor of five-thirds. And so grabbing my calculator, I have 10 to a power of, and I'm just going to put it as 1.666 into my calculator, divided by 15 raised to a power of 1.6666 times then the 1400. So if I did my math right, I got 712 point three for the pressure. So 712.3 there. Right? Can we only use that equation for adiabatic? Yes. Yes. Uh, and in the interest of time I won't go back and show you, but we uh, we assume the Q was equal to zero when we derived this. So it has to be adiabatic. Um, of course, now that I have this, I can jump over to here and get the temperature, right? Then, so the temperature at D would be the pressure at D, volume at D, divided by N and R. And so the pressure is 712 
the volume is 15 and that's in kilo but that's in liters so I got to multiply by that by a thousand and divide that by a thousand so I won't change anything so that comes out to be joules I'm gonna watch my units there divide by the number of moles well they told me that 2.34 and divide that by R 8.31 and I get a temperature of 549.4 and since the C to D is connected by an isotherm there that must be the same temperature and then if I know the temperature, I know any two, I can get this one, so this must be the pressure at C. So again, same idea, pressure at C would be NR times the temperature at C divided by the volume at C. So I already have the temperature, let me multiply that by 8.31, let me multiply that by the number of moles, let me divide that by the volume at C, which they say is 24, and I come up with a pressure of 445 kilopascals. And that becomes helpful because again, now that I know so much about C, C is connected to B. And that is the adiabatic process also. Although the two unknowns are P and V, so I probably want to connect something like the V and the T since I know the, the, the T up here. So a little bit of mathematics here. But I know that the pressure at B times the volume at B to a factor of gamma and the pressure at C times the volume at C to a factor of gamma, those match. But I don't know those two in terms of B. So let's do a conversion here. Let's do this to an NR times the temperature at B divided by the volume at B. Same thing at C. Um, I suppose I don't even need to convert that because I know that one. Uh, but just to be consistent, I guess I will. And what I end up with is the temperature at B times the volume at B to a factor of gamma minus one. Uh, minus one, thank you, is equal to the temperature at C times volume at C gamma minus one. And so finding the volume at B uh, raised to a power of 0.66666 because it's 1.66 minus 1 would be the temperature at C which we said was 549.4 times the volume at C which is 24 raised to 0.66666 divided by the temperature at B which is 720. So a little more calculator work, but I should get the volume then at B by going 549.4 times 24 raised to a power of 0.66666 divided by 720. Um, Okay, so that is the volume raised to that power. So to undo it, I need to raise it to a power of 0.6666666 reciprocal, coming up with about a 16. So this is about a 16. Um, so B and D are a little more on top of each other than in my drawing here. But definitely B is between these two. And of course now I can get the pressure because if I know the N and the R and the T and then divide it by the volume I should get the pressure of 875. Yeah.
A to D right here? Oh, well, unlike this one, where I have the ideal gas law that is in joules, I don't need to worry about my units coming out to be joules. So, as long as I have the same units on both sides of the equation, whether they be pascals, kilopascals, atmospheres, bars, tors, whatever unit of pressure, as long as it's matched on that side, I'm good. But that's the answer, is I'm not using the ideal gas law in there. Yeah. And also, you multiply the kilo a thousand and then the liters, you multiply by a thousand to get right? right, and then that's the second thing to this is, if I was doing the ideal gas law here, which I did later on, I don't need to convert kilopascals to pascals as long as I don't convert liters into cubic meters because the multiplication factor here is a thousand and the multiplication factor here is also a thousand. So ignoring it twice, in other words, kilopascals times liters gives me joules, just like Pascals times cubic meters gives me joules. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I wanted to do a little bit more time on some other ones. Maybe I'll springboard off this one then and say, all right, here is the pressure and volumes and temperatures of this gas. What about the energies? What about A to B? B to C, C to D, D back to A. What is the change in internal energy? What is the change in heat or the exchange of heat during each process? What is the work done in each process? And new today, what is the change in entropy? in each process. And so we've done a lot of this and just in case, oh and we are going to run out of time, let me do this one first. Okay? And so let's look at A to B. The change in entropy from A to B would be the integral from A to B of dq over T, right? Ah, wonderful luck for me is what happens from A to B? Yeah, it is an isotherm. So what do I know about the temperature? It's constant and in this case is 720. So this would be the Q from A to B and divided by the temperature of 720, right? So before I can really answer this, I better also answer this. So what is the Q from A to, oh, bummer. Don't worry about What is the Q from A to B? Is it equal to the word? Ah, it's isotherm. So, these are these little puzzles. I know that this is zero. So I'm probably better off to calculate this and then say Q is the negative of that. So Q from A to B is negative of the work from A to B. And the work is negative the integral of PDV. And that makes a plus, that kind of makes sense, we were putting heat into it here. And the pressure would be nRT over V dV. And so I will get an nRT natural log of final volume over initial volume. So if I now come over here and add that into here, and I, maybe I should have just left this as a T because I'm going to have an NR 
the T over the T is going to cancel off. And so what I end up with is an N, an R, and the natural log of the ratios of the volumes between them. Now, hopefully this makes sense. First of all, was this an increase or a decrease in entropy? Increase, why? Well, heat goes in is what I'm looking for. The second law says everything, so I got to look at going in but and, the, and going out and the environment is cooling here. But what I'm after here is notice that heat went in so it's positive, but also look at a molecular level. Did these molecules go any faster? Yes. Yes. Isn't this an isotherm? Yeah. So where'd the entropy come from? They're in a bigger space. Okay, so as we mentioned before, entropy is that randomness. So the randomness could be that they're going faster because their temperature is higher, but their randomness is they could be spread out in a bigger space, and that's our increase in entropy. Okay, oh, real quick maybe, what about here to here? What's the change in entropy of B to C? Zero, why? It's adiabatic and Q is zero. Q is zero. <laughs> this is, <laughs> and then this is going to be the same number and opposite. So when you add these, and you add these entropies, what's the change in entropy of the whole cycle? Zero. Zero. It's the Carnot cycle, right? This is the best one we can do. All right, y'all throw the pennies one more time. All right. Yeah.